Yep, good day, data engineering internship. Dennis is with us. Accept from my increase and also want to share my screen and to see what is the agenda for today. I, I didn't have time, Chris, sorry for this, to check this network running locally, why pod is running and that is not spin up properly, but we'll check it probably tomorrow on a Friday. It will be much, much better with my free time. And also Dennis is here with us to try to cover the uh, let's say he's explore, he wants to share experience about uh, late arriving dimension principles about natural key when you have more frequent load in fact and slower load in the measures if I'm not wrong. So I would focus personally to this topic if it's not a problem. What do you think? Good for me. Mm -hmm. Chris, what do you yeah, think? Yes, sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, Dennis, let's give you the brief introduction about actually what we cover up to now. Chris did a great job about analyzing the models for Salesforce. What is SDFS? SDFS? Chris, I'm not sure about that. It's Salesforce. It's the Salesforce Opportunity Data. Opportunity Data. Yeah, yeah if I'm not wrong, I checked the load of data every six hours in the extraction part. And also we want to get closer to that part when it comes to transformation, but also to open some doors to do it more frequently. And as I said, Chris did a great job to analyze the models and approximate time of execution for this set of models we want to, to focus and actually do extraction from the main DAG and put it into the separate DAG. For that reason, also we discovered a couple of good options. Uh, I would. I already mentioned earlier today to Dennis about the selectors option. So instead of have a long sausage with commands you want to use, you can say dbt run hyphen hyphen selector and selector name, right? Mm -hmm. And in that case, it can be a good general approach for the entire transformation part or all dbt jobs. But yeah, it means you can sort of combine tags and paths, include the or whatever you want, right? Yeah, yeah. And actually, Dennis, we need your help here about what we talk about this late driving the measure principle, how we should implement this. Because the main idea is try to convert from full to incremental load each model where it's suitable and it makes sense. Do not over complex everything. But as a share at the top, in my point of view, we need these principles with late driving the measure. So we want to hear from your experience about that. Okay, cool. And yeah, late arriving dimension principle only makes sense if you use incremental models. If you do full refreshes, then there is no benefit. The, the idea behind late arriving dimensions is that text most of the time has higher frequency data. If you took, take a look at, let's say, an opportunity, and I don't know what more dimensions we have there. Uh, sorry, one more thing. It only applies to text and dimensions, not to mark tables, not to report tables, not to prep tables. So really with text and dimensions. Okay. The idea behind this is, is that facts are updated more frequent than dimensions. Eh? Let's say you have a tech table opportunity out of salesforce.com. And there's also a dimension table. And I don't know which dimensions are applying to this fact table. Also in dim table, which is called client, for example. The client itself, all the attributes will not change frequently. Yeah? Uh, the name of the client will not change frequently. The, the, the contact version of the client will not change frequently. They do maybe, but that's why it's also called slow changing dimensions. Text data, most of the time, especially if you have an event-driven fact table, is updated more frequently. So there are a lot of opportunities, hopefully, <laughs> um, put into Salesforce. So you see a lot of new opportunities. So from that perspective, it makes sense to update also the fact table more frequent rather than updating the dimension more frequent. Eh? Um, if you want to see a high level uh, number, high level KPI, uh, the number of uh, opportunities as of now, Likely you don't need to have all the attributes who are in the dimension. Maybe you want to divide or aggregate or group by on some of those 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 dimension uh, on those attributes. But because they will not change that frequently, it makes perfect sense to only focus on the fact table. The problem is as soon as you put in a 
new fact line. So in this case, a new opportunity into the fact table opportunity. And you don't update first the dimension table. You cannot create a join between the fact and the dimension table. And then you may can miss data if you do an inner join between your fact table and the dimension table. So the principle behind late and arrived dimensions is that you already put a placeholder in the dimension table with, if you have surrogate keys, a surrogate key, the natural key, but none of the attributes. Um, and let's say once per night, you're going to update all the attributes following the normal frequency, what we have already right now. So that means that you don't have a high loading process where you need to capture changing dimensions here. Uh, you can only do inserts in the, in, the, in the dimension table and you only can do the inserts into the fact table, which is much more efficient rather than doing facts, uh, do, doing a full update on the dimension table and then going to do an update or an insert on the fact table. Sorry, Dennis, I have one question here. I will put it down. Regarding, um, as you said later, I'm dating with the placeholder, like fake, not fake record, but the record only populated with that surrogate or pseudo key. Technically, how we should implement that in, in, in DBT, let's say, in our case. Yeah, basically, you create a new job for that dimension table. So that's why it's also important to do an incremental and not a full update. And the question is, I don't know exactly how this is possible and if this is possible in, in, in DBT, by the way. So that's something we have to investigate. So this is like, like a conceptual level of theoretically speaking, how to feel. But I was just wondering, maybe you have an experience <laughs> in, in real life, how to technically sort out this, what is the best practice? So. Yeah, I have, but not in DBT. So uh -huh. I use, for example, Talent, uh, Informatica Power Center, IBM Data Stage for doing this, but not via DBT. Yeah, I know in Talent, uh, ETL tool, you can define, okay, this will be SCD1, SCD2 type, and automatically when you determine the type, Mechanism is, is built like that under the hood. That yeah. is what I know from my experience. Yeah, the the all the um models that we've looked at for the Salesforce opportunity they are they are all who refreshes. Um and given the the short, the the run pretty quickly because there's only like two hundred and fifty thousand rows or something. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, because we, we just want to create some kind of exercise. If we were to play and pretend we want to switch from, let's say, full refresh to incremental, but also you spoke with Peter Impey, right, Chris, about one model we found is kind of more most complex. And in that case, if we try to reorganize it, it will be very very. Yeah, that's crazy, right. right. Yeah, we looked at putting, making some of these incremental, and it would, I mean, incremental models are really useful for large models, but it does increase the complexity of the code that goes into it. So, mm -hmm. um, we, and a lot of these have got many different inputs. So it was, uh, we sort of felt that it was more more trouble than it was going to be worth. It would have increased in complexity, and don't think you would have seen much. Improvement in run times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true because I think this fact model we analyze it's com have a couple of components on mm -hmm. various sources, as you say. It's not only Salesforce and also some, let's say, side side tables to fill the data and everything like that, right? Yeah. So then it's in that case, what you should propose because probably this is not the best design model in the world. I, I saw can keep can be optimized, but as Chris said, it can be over complex, like. You will put a lot of engineering effort and do not have great benefits of that. Uh, that's true. On the other hand, if you want to roll this out uh, furthermore, um, can also be a showcase to show that this concept yes. will work towards the future. So, uh, when, 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 if we don't do it right now, when do we want to do it then? That's basically then the question. Yeah, there. that's true. That's true. But because we start optimistic, like okay, let's let's pick up one model and try to, to reorganize it to be incremental instead of load but as Chris said it's super complex so when you try to touch this actually you need to to, to write it from the scratch probably or most of the things will not be reused or does be discarded so in this case I want to see how to reconcile this late arriving data against complex model under the hood because for now Chris label everything needed for for the new deck and also he excluded everything from the existing deck so now we have a material to create a completely separate deck I just need to check why dbt model run is not spin up on the cluster 
on testing environment. And also the main question is, okay, how, how to approach this to optimize this tennis? What do you think? Should we put more effort here or how, how, how to create a good shot case in, let's say, cost-efficient manner when it comes to time and resources? Yeah, well, I missed one thing. Are we going to switch from full to an incremental load here or not? I don't think so. Um, the Looking into some of these prep CRM opportunity, there's many different sources. So it would just make it quite complex to update right. some part to of it to be incremental. Um, yeah. And the thing I'm asking, yeah, because what, what I from what I hear right now, basically is we exclude uh, a certain flow from some source models to the to the to the prod layer. So let, let's say from raw to prep, we exclude it from the regular one, and we do it in a new one, and we schedule that four times per day. So I try to see where can we raise the bar a little bit here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not proper engineering work also around. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But this is the model we talk about, right? Well, can we zoom in a little bit? It's, I don't know how. To... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me close. Yeah, this is a little bit better. Oh, uh, no, this is good. This is good. Okay. Uh, okay. That over. Um, so this this is actually this is the model, and it uses a macro. I, I wasn't involved. I'd have to speak to Michelle about how this is put together, but. Um, These, this macro, I've never made a macro into incremental, but um, I mean, there, there would be ways of doing it. Uh, what was the name of the actual, it was SFDC opportunity source. It's the first one, right? <clears throat> Also, the pro one of the problem with this model, Dennis, is because many values are hard coded here, not exposed as a table, but exposed in a hard code manner as a table, like one, two, three, four, five, the meaning of all, all these facts. So that's the catch here, one of the issue, I would say. And this is built based on macro, right, Chris? And I think it's used in two times with two live and one another parameter, right? Yeah, that's that's right. Um... Uh, if it's live, so this has an inner join on prep CRM user. So I suppose we'd have to see prep CRM user updated as well to see this data coming through. And what's the source for prep CRM users? Do we know? Oh, this is another FTC user fields. SFDC users source. That's snapshot source. So I'd, why would we be? So as long as it's not a new Salesforce user that we don't have in that day. So I, I don't imagine that, you know, someone would be created and then opportunities would come in again. That's how I'm assuming it works. Yeah, in this case, theoretically, probably not. But what Dennis pointed out makes perfect sense for me because sometimes you, you, can, you can tell late arriving data from some other size, side and you miss that information. And if you apply the principles with late arriving data and fill the facts completely, because you have the facts, but let's say you, you miss new user, new player, new customer, whatever, then you need to put just place called the folder record in dimension. In that case, this is an inner join, so you, you will not lose the data. But theoretically speaking, let's say we isolated this DAG and data are coming from another side and it can be late. But now we're yeah, focusing so... how, how, how to make this simple or incremental from full load, then is because you see it's a bit complex. So is it is it just it's only the opportunity models that's on the six hourly schedule from Stitch? Is that correct? No, everything. All Salesforce.com um, is scheduled every six hours. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Extraction is based on that because we have one job. I think it's in Stitch and move all of the data every six, six hours in incremental fashion. Yeah.
Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how. Um, I think you know if it was if we were looking at a larger, longer running model, then definitely, and we do generally make those into incremental. Um, but these small, sort of very quick running ones, it, it's it's often better for the sim simplicity of a full refresh. But what we want to show, what Danny said, is that you use case for us, but what stops us to use this model or convert it to incremental is kind of complexity. So I'm thinking, what, what's the best way to implement that short case? Is there any option to move forward in this fashion and just rise that bar? Um, probably not within this sort of lineage. I I don't I don't think. Let's see in documentation maybe. I think. So we've got the selectors file, which is the new functionality that um, would be used in the in the DAG. Mm -hmm. And that's um so we've got a selector called six hourly salesforce opportunity. And then the the DAG itself. It's called dbt6 hourly. Mm -hmm. And the code in there simply just is a call selector instead of all these codes. Yeah, it's a dbt run and you just specify the selector and that yeah. will run the models that are tagged with six hourly tag. Yeah, this is this is we implement then is for information uh, to make everything flexible. Let's say we want to run it. Uh, there was discussion, okay, how to touch something to run hourly, but actually our idea is to have six hourly in a first iteration and later on to be able to decrease the time up to five minutes, half an hour, one hour, whatever. And yeah, Chris found this very nice and elegant solution with these selectors, so we can easily just find and replace tags like six hours. So we combine Salesforce six hours. Tomorrow we can combine Salesforce with five minutes run, if you know what I mean. So it's very easy to keep everything in control. So that part is also covered. And I think it's also a very nice feature to have because we will run this as a separate uh, tag, uh, Airflow tag. But the main question for us is uh, how to pick up one showcase for increment a lot from from full load, that's that's the question mark for that's, us. Because the concern right now is just that flow is too complex with too mm -hmm. many dependencies to make it incremental, right? Yes, that's true. Okay. Because but we pick up the heavy, heaviest model here. Even all of them are kind of, let's say, relatively fast and quick in execution, even in full load. But we want to expose one example. Okay, we know how to do this. Yeah. But yeah, as you said, the, the main concern here is about over complexity for this showcase and also contains the several sources can okay. create a problem. Another, another question, yeah? what happens if uh, this deck, this six hour deck runs at the same time as the extraction is running? It will pick up the latest data, it has. The, the, yeah, the all, also one thing we consider is come out with some, to have some sensor to check is extraction done or not. I know from the previous projects I was working on, that was a catch, like theoretically speaking, not it will be locked. It will, you will just load the data from some point of time, actually what you find in the raw layer in Snowflake, because it's mm, this DBT DAG is blind about stitch extraction at the moment. Yeah. yeah. But we consider that option like, okay, we have some stitch notification, we have something in, in, in a raw layer and we can use that information to manage yeah. Or tell this DAG what how to behave in some let's say special situation if there is overlapping. But theoretically speaking, you will pick up what you have, and next time you will pick up what you have and start from that point in time. Yeah, in this problem, case, everything is full. The problem is, eh, uh, in the Salesforce.com extraction, we extract multiple tables. We yes. extract a customer table, like I saw, and also an opportunity table. Opportunity, yes. But I don't know what the what the specific order is here. But let's say. Um, the extract is running. We extract the opportunity table, then the deck kicks in, but the customer table hasn't been loaded, which can happen. Eh? The, the, That's a late driving dimension principles we need. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So in my opinion, uh, what I would like to have, oh, 
well, my, my personal vision here is that a downstream data, bol data model um, should run properly regardless what happens upstream. So yes. it needs to be, uh, let's say, flexible. Can I call it flexible? Yep. Or, or adaptive to what happens because anything can happen. What also can happen is that the extraction for the opportunity table goes well and there is an error on the user extraction, right? So if, if we now have the philosophy that we do a full refresh because we don't know exactly what happens for hocus pocus i think that's that's not the right the right thing to do and i think the impact is less if you do it once per day eh? because then the chance that it runs in parallel is is is, is, is lower and but even you know, it's sorry even it's lower you also have most of the data yeah you will probably miss a couple of hours yeah because you load <laughs> data six hours every six hours and in transformation you run it once per day yeah, you're not missing full um, day of data. You're missing one to three hours maximum in some crazy case. How is the data loaded? Is it a truncated and load, or is it just yeah. appended, inserted uh, to the end? Uh, okay. Actually, when you, when you when you define the stitch integration, you can say which way you want to do. As Danny said in some other tools, it's called STD one, STD two. Here is called like not tracked key based incremental full refresh, something like that. But usually, I'm looking now. I can share my screen if you want, just to show you. Um, they just call it in a different name, a Baptist, a different method. See, I say table account, it's key-based incremental. So key-based no incremental. Yeah, so append, no truncate insert. Mm -hmm. Okay. Most of the these definitions are key-based incremental, so probably same as Montana incremental. You have ID, and if ID last load is 1000, I will start from 1001 next time, save it, and start from there. So it's always going, going, going. And later on, on our side, we switch the logic and philosophy and do a full refresh all the time, right? Because here is it, the fact is this is incremental load, right? If I'm not wrong, key based incremental. Yeah. And then on our side, we do a full load, as Danny said, because for this focus, focus don't want to, to mess with this. Maybe it's a good time to challenge that approach and try to fit it somehow differently. And as Danny explained nicely, it can happen that something is going late or something is screw up with low probability, of course, but we need to be prepared for that. All oh, that's just I'm thinking about the best use case, how to rise the bar and expose yeah. hands-on experience. And of course, yeah, I'm not in favor of over-engineering anything. No, so no, no. Uh, please, please make, keep it as boring as, as, as possible, of course. So uh, I understand that if a model runs in two seconds, if you do a full full load, yeah, why should you engineer an incremental load here? I completely understand. Mm -hmm. Normally, yeah. But in this case, where we do an explorational thing uh, on DBT sharding, maybe for this one, we can do it super boring and just scheduling, scheduling it four times per day, every six hours. But I also see this as a showcase to roll this out any further. Mm -hmm. So from that respect, I would say, yeah, indeed, don't over-engineer it. But I think if we want to do TBT sharding, or if we want to shard out the big deck, what we have right now, mm -hmm. run it, that's the second use case, run it also multiple times per day to give our consumers data more frequently, I think then we have to come up with something what we don't have right now, because if we exactly. want a, 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 a more frequent load on the models that we have right now, I think that's not doable because it now already runs for eight or nine hours and if you want to do yeah. it, that's not possible. So from a sharding perspective, I think uh, that selector mechanism is fantastic because it gives a lot of flexibility to shard out the decks. But to make the next step to, to raise the bar a little bit, I also would like, that's my opinion here, uh, if we also can implement something that leads to more efficient loading and more robust loading to increase the frequency, I think that would be great as well. Despite the provider and despite type of the data, right? I would say 
Our first takeaway for now is a uh, sh sharded plan to how to shard one deck for any provider. Second takeaway is uh, switch to selector option and make it very, very flexible. And then you open a very various options to decrease the load, increase the load, do whatever you want, include, exclude, and enough. And the third takeaway, what we are actually missing here, we want to agree on that, to rise a bar and provide comprehensive Swiss knife how to shard everything is that incremental uh, load from full and also later running dimension, right, Dennis? This is how I see this. This is my okay. vision. Exactly. Another great example is GitLab.com data. Uh, previously, we had just one database instance where all the data was in. Now we already have two, a main and a CI. If you want to combine those data sets, basically you're combining data from two different data sources, technically. So if one pipeline fails, which happens now sometimes, you also need to prepare to a situation for a situation where the models in DBT are robust enough to handle these kinds of situations where a pipeline could fail. And now we have two instances. Um, hopefully in the future, we have hundreds of thousands of instances. If we go to a port, port sharding architecture, where we have thousands of database instances for our SaaS platform. And I can guarantee if we have hundreds of pods where we need to extract the data from, some of them will fail in the end, right? Uh, every now and then. So everything can fail all the time. So that's the first no. assumption, right? <laughs> so more, you need to build a system around that. The more you have, the likelihood that something will break will also increase here. So the data landscape will only be more complex. And the question now, of course, is uh, to, which, to what extent do we want to prepare ourselves for that? Uh, well, that's basically a little bit up to you. Mm -hmm. um, I think indeed uh, the selector mechanism is already great. We can do good sharding with that mechanism. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how much time we have left uh, in terms of developing a little bit more. But if you also can make a next step, raise the bar a little bit to uh, efficiently uh, uh, support more frequent data loading, I think that we do an even greater job than we do it already right now. But the pink selectors are kind of ready. We just need to implement this somewhere. But we we know the mechanism. Like it's very fairly simple, and we can simplify the process. As I said, first takeaway is to establish a good process of how to do a sharding. We have a specific steps. Like we have a method, and also yeah. selectors are good, good, good option for us generally. Even now, even without sharding, you can use selectors instead of these long, long commands. Okay. Because that 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 selector mechanism, eh? Putting that in a YAML file, uh, yeah. I think that's also very beneficial for the analytics engineers because right now, if there are new models created, um, at least if I do it, uh, for example, for, for, for a certain source to ex 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 uh, um, provide the data in a workspace model, for me, it is unclear how I can schedule that one. So I bet that it is in the DBT job. But if you can explicitly define when those models have to run via deck sharding, via the selector mechanism, I think that's fantastic. So that's a good uh, good option to use indeed. Yeah, I think Peter's working on something related to the selector yeah, YAML yeah. as well. So he's he's also looking at it. So we'll have to get those merged together. And everything is in one place in that case, which is great. You have one YAML file with all management when it comes yeah. to DBT. So you can do it generically. You can run one class, use this configuration, generically can do whatever you want. And also you need to change just one file, not compiling, not just change YAML and you're there, right? Yeah. So I would say for now, we're running all the time, agreed on three main takeaways. Use a good process or establish a process of how to execute a sharding, not sharing, and we'll share our share. <laughs> the lectures saying how to leverage usage of them also not in sharding, but generally speaking. And the first, the pain point for us at the moment, how to find the optimal way for robust DBT load creation in case something fail or something rapidly or radically grows, like from one to 100 databases, which is really possible scenario in the next couple of years, right? We spoke with Robin Good Company, then as you remember, they have 30 databases, which is, they are fairly small, but you have a lot of components, which also lead you to high probability of something will fail. You have. 30, 30 components instead of one, right? And maybe the fourth takeaway, number D. Yeah. Um, find a optimal way to provide high frequent 
loading or data processing in dbt and optimal way to provide yeah. more frequent data loading or data processing i don't think we should call it processing mm -hmm. right in process the day in. yeah usually that is contains in number one but can i put it as a number b or two Because somehow I, I I connected with the first one, but just my okay. vertical order how to put here. So I will also put this in issue. Thanks for your help, Dennis. You're welcome. Uh, Chris, I'll just put everything in agenda and also in issue. So what's our next steps? Now it's holiday season, so probably a few weeks this will lag a bit, and after that we'll yeah, press the pedal to the metal. Today, so yeah. Pick up in the new year and then new year.